Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Heterogeneous Parallel Programming class. We're starting our week three, and in, uh, we're at lecture 3.1, Performance Considerations, and we're going to be looking at DRAM bandwidth in this lecture. The objective of this lecture is to help you to learn the first order performance considerations in a massively parallel processor, namely the memory bandwidth. And um, we're going to uh, go over some of the fundamentals of DRAM design in modern computers so that you can better understand some of the performance characteristics and trade-offs that we have in programming. And all the principles that we talk about here will actually also app be applicable to other types of modern processors. Here we show a conceptual picture of what our expectations uh, are and what our uh, what the reality is in uh, global memory or uh, design. Global memory in GPUs are realized in dynamically random access memory or DRAM. So the kind of bandwidth that we would like to have in the uh, in in a system is like uh, the top picture where uh, we have a uh, reservoir of data and uh, we have a floodgate and whenever we open up the floodgate the data just gush out and um, you get all the data that you want. So that would be the ideal. And in reality, what happens is that uh, uh, whenever we need data, uh, the data actually will come out uh, very, very uh, uh, slowly. And um, uh, this is like sipping data through a cup. And this is the picture that I want you to remember uh, when, when we use a uh, DRAM system for a massively powerful processor, we will never be able to get enough data out of the DRAM, and we always will be looking for algorithm methods and so on to reduce the, the DRAM de uh, bandwidth demand and uh, make the best use of every byte of data that we get out of the DRAM system. And so this, the purpose of this lecture is actually to go into a little bit deeper of the, the DRAM design so that you get a better intuition about why we're getting in this kind of situation, why we uh, care so much about tile algorithms, and later on, why do we care so much about uh, memory coalescing and, um, uh, for, as a performance uh, optimization. So here we show a, a simple uh, block diagram for modern DRAM design. And this is the organization of one DRAM bank in modern computers. So uh, here we show that um, uh, the DRAM cell core array is organized into a two-dimensional array. And um, we typically uh, would like to have a, uh, as square a design as possible for these chips. So let's say if we have uh, four megabytes, uh, megabits of uh, storage that we would like to or coordinate, uh, organize, then we will be actually designing the, the core array to be as close to 2K bits by 2K bits as possible. And um, uh, each array uh, will, have, uh, the, uh, will, will, will be accessed by a uh, row decoder. So uh, if we have 2K by 2K array, we will need to have uh, a row decoder that can determine 2K locations. And um, that will be determined by uh, some parts of the address bits that we use in accessing memory. And um, uh, once the row is accessed from the core array, uh, that row is going to be uh, the, uh, the sense by a, what we call the sense amplifier technology. And this, these sense amplifiers are actually uh, very sensitive uh, circuitry that will determine whether a particular storage cell has a zero or one value and uh, make that determination so that you can uh, forward the information to the column latches. And once the entire row comes out, all the columns are latched into the column latches, then uh, we, we will use the column address to determine a particular part of that row that, should, uh, that uh, will satisfy the user request address. So the user the supplied address will be the divided into uh, row address, which usually is the upper part, and the column address, which is usually the lower part for this particular uh, uh, bank. And then uh, the data will, uh, will come out. So uh, out of the column latch, we have a very wide uh, row, but then the multiplexer here will select 
a part of that row to come out. So it's become, it becomes a narrower uh, set of data, and that goes on to the off-chip data bus to, uh, to be shipped back into this, uh, the processor. So all the, um, all the computers that we are, will be using in, uh, for this course will basically use a D, uh, the DRAMs where uh, the DRAM uh, banks or DRAM chips are going to be designed uh, based on this particular organization. So here we show a, a very small 8 by 2 bit DRAM bank. So we have eight locations that we store in, this, uh, in the DRAM bank, and we have every, in every location two bits. In reality, these DRAM uh, banks are going to be organized into uh, essentially millions of locations, and each location is going to have anywhere between uh, four, eight, and even two, probably 32 uh, bits in the, uh, in the design. So uh, obviously, this is just a very small example to allow you to visualize what's going on in the access process. So we have a, in order to access three locations in the DRAM, we need to have eight, uh, eight locations in the DRAM, we need to have three bits. And um, uh, with the eight locations are going to be organized into four rows, and each row will contain two locations. So the 16 bits will be organized into a four by four core array. And um, uh, so now, uh, in order to access uh, one of the locations, we're going to use the upper two bits of the address to, uh, to select one of the four rows. And each row that gets selected, let's say uh, for, uh, for this case, 0, 1, which is the 0, 1 location uh, row in the picture, we will have two locations in that row. So we're going to use the, um, the, low, uh, the lowest order bit to select one of the two, uh, two, two bit locations in that row to come out for the processor. So here we show that all the four bits will come into the sense amplifier and the column latches, and then we will use one of uh, the lowest order bit to select the higher order uh, location two bits, and those are the two bits that will be accessed out of the DRAM bank with this address. So now we are getting to the point, uh, the, um, the point of why DRAMs are so slow, why the DRAM bandwidth is always limited, and so on, and why is it so important to be able to optimize our memory accesses. The DRAM cores are uh, usually very, very slow, and uh, they are made in, uh, by a uh, semiconductor process that maximizes the storage uh, the amount of storage or capacity of information rather than access speed. The, the market demands bigger and bigger DRAMs, but the market does not encourage fast DRAMs. Whenever you have a choice between delivering a smaller but faster DRAM versus a, a bigger and a, a, sm a, sm a slower DRAM, uh, the market usually will prefer a bigger but slower DRAM. So that drives the design of the cores to be slow. And um, reading from a cell in the core array is a very slow process, and this is essentially how it is designed. And um, this line is the line that we showed in the previous uh, slide from the uh, row decoder. And so this is the, uh, the line that will go and select one of the rows for, um, for data to come out. And um, uh, this, we show one of the bits in the storage out of that row. And um, we typically will have one to 2,000 of these cells uh, on this horizontal uh, wire. So this is a very, very long uh, you know, wire that goes into the array. And then um, whenever, uh, when, when we access a, a, a bit, it's actually opening up a transistor that connects uh, into a capacitance. The capacitance is, uh, is where we store the information of zero or one. And whenever we have charge in the uh, transistor, it's a one. And whenever we don't have charge in that, uh, in that capacitor, we, uh, it's a zero. And this capacitance is actually very, very small capacitance. It's essentially what we call the parasitic capacitance for the transistor. It's actually a byproduct of building a transistor in that uh, process. Now, we actually have a very long line here, too. Remember, we have 
you know, thousands of uh, rows. So all those transistors for this bit in all these rows are going to be connected to this vertical line. And eventually this line goes into the sense amplifier. So what's happening is that um, whenever we access a particular uh, uh, cell, we open up this, uh, this gate transistor here, and then uh, there will be a small amount of charge. Whenever the information is one, there will be a small amount of charge that will be uh, going from the capacitance into the line. And um, so this is a extremely delicate process. You can think about this as uh, a very long hallway of offices, let's say, uh, for this vertical line. You can think about this work vertical line as a very long hallway in your office building. And you can think about the, um, the transistor here as the door into one of the offices in this very long hallway. And then you can think about that capacitance as someone holding a coffee mug with some coffee in the mug. And then the person will blow the coffee mug, uh, the, the aroma of the coffee into the hallway. And then the, ar the aroma is going to tr have to travel down, like say hundreds of uh, yards into, the, uh, into someone who's going to smell the air and try to determine what the flavor of that coffee is. So this is a extremely slow process and extremely difficult process. It's a miracle that it even works in modern DRAMs. So that's why this whole, uh, whole process for that charge to eventually reach that sense amplify can be a very, very slow process. That's why uh, the DRAMs cores operate at much slower speed as, uh, than the interface that, that deliver the data to the processors. So for uh, DDR, the original um, the DDR DRAM design, the uh, core operates at about half of the interface speed. And then when we went to DDR2, DDR3, the core operates at one quarter of the interface. And now we're at DDR3, DDR4 generation, and the core operates at one eighth of the interface speed. As you can see that the trend is actually going into slower and slower core design. And that's because these cores are actually becoming bigger and bigger in capacity and uh, we're sacrificing the strength of all these capacitance and uh, transistors just so that we can uh, pack more of those into the chip. And that means that the access into these uh, cells are becoming slower and slower. So that's why uh, when we build a system, uh, we actually need to uh, compensate for the fact that um, the cores are clocked at one end of the speed as the interface. So whenever uh, we have a system where we have two parts of the system that has a, a big speed mismatch, we, have, we, we will need to replicate uh, some of these components in order to compensate for that mismatch. A good example is that uh, whenever we have a tow uh, station area in, on the freeway, uh, cars travel on the freeway at, let's say, 65 miles per, uh, per hour. Or you know, in some countries, there may be even unlimited uh, speed uh, per hour, you know, the speed that the car can tra travel on the freeway. However, when the cars approach a tow station, then the cars have to slow down. So we have an area on that freeway where the speed of the cars need to be reduced. So in order to not create a huge congestion and um, uh, allow the, um, the speed of this area, the, the rate at which we can uh, have the cars to go through this area to more or less match the, uh, speed, uh, the rate at which cars will be coming in from the freeway, um, we need to replicate the toll station. That's why we invariably will have a large number of these toll, uh, toll booths that will uh, provide a lot more higher throughput than what each individual toll booth can provide. And that's why when you have a freeway, when you approach the uh, toll station area, you will see that um, the freeway will begin to have a lot more lanes than feeding into each of these toll booths. So we have a very similar situation with the DRAM core design. Because the DRAM cores are so much slower than the interface, we need to have a large number of those 
uh, lines coming out of the DRAM core to feed into a faster interface so that we can fully utilize the, the, the interface bandwidth. And this is um, essentially the reason why we design these systems so that the, uh, the buffer width of these DRAMs that are coming out of the, uh, the column that latches tend to be, uh, you know, at least uh, uh, n times fast uh, more than the, uh, the interface width. So in, uh, in the DDR2 and DDR3 situation, the DRAM uh, buffer width need to be four times of the interface data path width in order to be able to, uh, to deliver enough data to, uh, to fully utilize the interface uh, uh, capability to deliver data to the processor. So this shows the, uh, the kind of a timing consideration for a, uh, a DRAM design for our A by two small example. So now we have a very slow core and so it takes a large amount of time for the core access to finish so that uh, we can have the bytes that will come out of the, uh, the column decoder into the interface. So, uh, so then uh, whenever we have that access finish, if we want another uh, uh, batch of uh, data, we need to uh, initiate another core decode and then it will take that same amount of time for another uh, batch of uh, bytes come, to come out of the, um, the, uh, the decoder, so uh, the multiplexer. So in order to, uh, to uh, minimize these delays, we have a DRAM burst timing. That is, uh, we, whenever we access a whole row of data into the, uh, in, into the, row, uh, the, the column latch, instead of just delivering the piece of data that the processor wants to access, we actually deliver a whole bunch of data around that piece of data. And uh, this is called a, a DRAM burst design. We will actually clock out uh, um, the neighboring bytes of the, the ag neighboring words of the DRAM access uh, in the next few clock cycles because the row is already in the column latch. So whenever um, we want to have more bytes out of that row, it's a very fast process. So this is the reason why all the modern DRAM systems are designed with burst timing. And this burst timing allows us to access a lot of bytes out of the DRAM. However, if the processor does not care about any other words in that area, uh, except for the word that is accessing, then um, the, um, all this data that gets bursted out of the DRAM and delivered to the processor will be wasted. So when we calculate the DRAM bandwidth or peak memory bandwidth in a CUDA programming system, we actually take, have already included the effect of bursting. So we, in order to take, make full util, uh, utilization of a DRAM system in a CUDA uh, pro programming environment, we really need to make sure that whenever a processor, uh, what the DRAM burst out the data, the processor can take advantage of all the data elements that are bursted uh, to the, out of, the, uh, out of the, the chip. Even more than bursting, we also need to have multiple DRAM banks in order to, uh, to, set, uh, to create more bandwidth. So what we just discussed is actually the design of one of the DRAM banks. In order for the system to get, uh, to provide a higher level of DRAM bandwidth, we typically will need to have multiple DRAM banks. Here we show the design of two DRAM banks. And um, on the top of the uh, timing diagram, we show that uh, one DRAM bank can, uh, will have some delay and burst out some data. And then it will go in and have an, another delay and then burst out the next batch of data. During the, uh, the access period, the DRAM bank will not be able to, to deliver any data to the processor. So we will have underutilized um, uh, DRAM system bandwidth. So in order to uh, solve this problem, we actually will have two of these banks operating in parallel with each other. And we're going to actually have one of the DRAM banks to access the cores and another the DRAM banks to actually bursting out data. 
So if we have enough of these banks to to come into the interface um, in a kind of a, a, a in turns with each other, then we can actually always have some kind of DRAM bank bursting into the interface and provide a full bandwidth utilization of that inter, uh, whole interface. So this um, brings us to a kind of a system view of things. So um, this is an example of one of the GPUs. This is you know, just one of the examples, and you shouldn't uh, be too uh, worried about this particular example, but it, uh, I'm giving you this example so that you have a, a little bit more concrete intuition about how the DRAMs work for these GPUs. So this is NVIDIA uh, GTX 280 GPU. The peak global memory bandwidth is 141.7 gigabytes per second. And um, it uses GDDR3 interface at 1.1 gigahertz. So uh, the core speed is actually 276 megahertz. It's one fourth of the interface speed. So for a typical 64-bit interface, if you multiply that by the number of uh, you know, the clock cycle, the clock frequency, and remember this clock is actually doubly clocked so that the data will come uh, twice. Uh, one in the rise edge, one in the low, uh, 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 trailing edge of a clock, uh, of a clock, and then we have eight bit interface. So uh, eight byte interface, 64 bit is eight bytes. Eight byte interface, two transfers for each clock cycle, 1.1 gigahertz clock. That gives us a total of 17.6. Two times eight times 1.1. 17.6 gigabyte per second bandwidth for that memory uh, uh, interface. Obviously, we're not going to uh, get 141.7 uh, gigabyte that way. So we actually need to have six of these uh, memory ch channels, each operating um, uh, each operating at 17.6 uh, gigabyte per second in order to provide that total of 141.7 gigabytes per second. My point here is that even though the 141.7 gigabyte per second, if you look at our previous calculations for matrix multiplication, uh, would drastically limit the amount of floating point operations you can get if every floating point operation requires a memory operand. However, I hope in this lecture it has become clear to you that even this moderate, moderate a uh, modest amount of memory bandwidth actually takes some very, very tough engineering effort in order to provide this level of memory bandwidth to, this, uh, to the uh, programmers and users. So this ends our uh, first lecture, and this should give you the necessary intuition and the insight into the cost of limited amount of memory bandwidth to available to the CUDA uh, uh, kernels. So uh, if you'd like to learn more about um, the DRAM technology and how, uh, the, how that, uh, the technology uh, uh, delivers the uh, bandwidth you know, to a you know, computer system, I'd like to encourage you to read uh, section 6.2 of the textbook. Thank you.